So we're going to continue where we came from coming out of, um, so Ethereum and, and human readable smart contracts and, and crypto wallets. Uh, we're continuing that with, uh, with um, Thomas Seinziger here, uh, talking about Minerva Digital Wallet Multiverse. Welcome. Thanks for coming. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So let's get into it. So I'm, I'm sharing my screen. So I'm going to talk about uh, the Minerva Wallet Multiverse. And uh, what we like to, uh, to say, it, it is like a physical wallet, just better. Um, and uh, in a sense, it is meant to, uh, to uh, work as a, as a, as a wallet um, for, for all the things what you do in life. So the, the thing, um, just, just a couple of words about us, because I said, well, we are not that well known. Um, so we are a cooperative in Graz. Uh, we have about 40 members. We are uh, active since 16 and uh, we have started the artist sidechain. So Ethereum compliant uh, sidechain, just like Po or XDAI. Uh, we have uh, worked on the Minerva digital wallets and we do a couple of customer projects so that uh, we also can uh, fund some of the stuff we do. We run the Kovan node. Uh, we do. Uh, we also run a XDAI node. We also run a Sovereign node. For the ones which don't know it, they are in the identity space. And of course, we also run uh, artist nodes. Um, we're working extensively on on things which we call kind of resilient networks. And uh, and I don't want to go into all that kind of text on that slide, but. The, the thing is that we are uh, extensively working on identity, decentralized identity. Um, and uh, we believe that basically a blockchain system uh, is needed or various kinds of blockchain systems are actually needed uh, to hook the identity, the storage and the computation there. Um, it is in our understanding a very big mixture of all those technologies. And uh, if we are uh, talking about Web3, um, then uh, we, we see the emergence of uh, a very kind of different architecture. Uh, the architecture for uh, more user-centered applications, um, where you have various kinds of tokens on different kind of blockchains, where you have uh, decentralized identifiers and verifiable credentials uh, from an identity perspective. Um, where you have storage and yesterday there were quite great talks uh, uh, about Swarm and uh, yeah, IPFS uh, was, was also very highlighted uh, during the conference and I think uh, they offer a super tool to store uh, also from a user perspective uh, the data what you need to store and on top of that you can build services uh, which are again uh, kind of helping everybody to, uh, to, yeah, to, to use that kind of data provided and still not uh, kind of getting into that kind of typical platform uh, thinking where all the data is siloed, uh, owned by somebody and, uh, and, and is, is basically not accessible. Um, so to make it possible that we all can use a little bit more uh, more uh, of that data and get better services and get a more open uh, and still privacy preserving uh, solutions uh, for the things what we want to have. Um, but now a little bit more into the multiverse. So um, when you start thinking about uh, wallets, uh, wallets are uh, all sorts of things and uh, and you have all sorts of directions and the, the drawing here, it should just represent the portion of it, uh, what you can think of in wallets. So you can think of uh, meta transactions, for example, to simplify transactions or uh, do a lot about key recovery. I think uh, many of us have already somewhere uh, lost some keys and that's kind of a, a big topic or that integration uh, or do we have open source wallets? And uh, I just listed a couple of the wallets uh, here because they're 
uh, representative for uh, special solutions uh, to that kind of multiverse, different kind of things, what you can build into a wallet uh, and, and, and later on basically use it, um, not just for transfer, but for using it with dApps, for uh, using it in different kind of networks and so on. So uh, the, the thing is that uh, we already see that we have loads and loads of wallets and uh, I don't know how it's for you, but for me, I have several of those which are listed here uh, on my phone and my funds are scattered all over the place. Um, and uh, and if you are looking especially at the identity space, uh, the two uh, on, the, on, the, on the bottom, Uport and, and Yolocom, uh, they're basically looking at everything what is identity and uh, all the others uh, work uh, not in that space, uh, which is a very, very kind of different uh, kind of crowd. Uh, and there is not so much mingling between crypto and, and identity. Um, so when we go a little deeper into Minerva, um, this is actually three uh, different kind of lines of uh, so we have the wallet, which is uh, currently under development and the Android wallet. Uh, we have the card, which is a NFC card. And we have Minerva Cash, which is basically um, basically a burner wallet. And, um, and I will not talk about too much about the card and the cash, but still give you a kind of an overview so that you can, can see what we're building there as well. So um, the burner wallet or Minerva Cash, as we call it, so you can test it while I'm talking. Uh, you just have to open Minerva.cash, so you will see the the more or less the the, the left screen um, as it is shown here. Um, and we're we 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 are really grateful that uh, Austin put out that uh, burner wallet, and uh, at some point we we said, well, we need something which works with the artist blockchain. And uh, then we just forked it and um, and and rewrote uh, some of the parts and then removed more or less all those nice features which were in there and left the receive and send and the backup and restore uh, for the wallet. And, uh, and then we were thinking what we can do. And uh, finally, we decided that we we're going to do a complete rewrite. So you see everything you see here, multi-network support, multi-token support, multi-language support, uh, three-box integration, which is also integrating basically IPFS, uh, and, the, uh, and the full progressive web app uh, implementation is, is something we want to uh, have in the new one and uh, the optics are a little bit changed, but basically it stays uh, very similar to the current version what we what we have out there. It's super helpful if you want to explain something to uh, newbies. Uh, and uh, we had a we had a nice presentation at a, at a conference uh, and it was called Crypto Bier Tavern or in German Crypto Bier Schenke. So I put there a short link uh, at the bottom of the slides, um, and uh, and there is a nice video where we where we presented uh, or involved people which had never done anything in crypto to get a couple of coins, uh, get some explanation how it works, and uh, finally get a beer and pay for the beer with the coins I just received. So super super uh, successful people really loved it. So the, the second one I wanted to talk about, and I'm going to use some of those, uh, is the Minerva card. Uh, you see, will see different designs. So there are a couple of design studies we made as well. So it is basically a NFC smart card uh, with an Infineon chip. Um, so uh, it creates on the card um, the, the keys. Um, and in the latest version, it's, I think, 99 keys, key pairs, what you can uh, create. Um, all the keys, well, the private keys, of course, can't be extracted. And uh, and you can can do a optional pin hook protection for, uh, for confirming or signing transactions uh, with that card. There was 
another talk from Galui Kral from Status. He talked about the key card and, um, and it's a very similar concept. So basically you're using NFC uh, on your mobile and uh, you're just kind of signing uh, transactions which are generated on the device. Uh, the, the import of a seed phrase is just possible for one of the keys. Uh, so basically all the other keys or key pairs, they're uh, created on the card. But it's maybe interesting because it continues with, uh, with Bitcoin. So it's, it's using uh, uh, elliptic curve cryptography and, and there are a couple of the usual curves uh, as far as I know. And, uh, and so that card is not just possible to be used for Ethereum, it can be used for uh, Ripple just as well as for Bitcoin and everything what is kind of Bitcoin like, um, it can be used. So basically, uh, it's it's kind of a nice way to do it, uh, to store or to move something uh, with that card. Nevertheless, if you lose the card and you put really on that key from the card, it's gone, as as we discussed uh, also the other day. Um, so the Minerva app. So we are, we are back to our multiverse. And as I said, so it's, it's supposed to be like your physical wallets. So the things, what you have in your wallet, uh, it is identities, it is, uh, kind of access cards to your accounts, like your bank cards, uh, some vouchers, some, whatever kind of stuff is, uh, is in your physical wallet. We want to make sure that we are transferring that one to the um, to the digital space. And uh, while well, most of the wallets today they are built for uh, for DeFi, we actually want to build a wallet for the real economy and the businesses uh, um, running there, interacting with the customers. And uh, sure, it is. Uh, needed that we have a simple and secure way of, of handling everything. And I would say we are non-custodial. So basically the keys are in full control of the user. It should be convenient. Um, and what is very special in our case uh, is a, a service integration uh, in the wallet. Um, we're uh, committed to open source. So we, we want to, to, to stay open source as much as possible. Um, and, uh, and, and that's, uh, that's really important to have open source wallets out there. Um, then use open standards. Uh, and of course, as much decentralization as possible um, in putting into that wallet. To give you a little bit an overview how it it actually looks like uh, and i'm going to show it to you uh, live as well a little later um, so it is an identity wallet first so uh, you can create identities and if you're familiar with the uh, decentralized identity space usually you have one identity and that one identity is then interacting with all kinds of things uh, and we thought uh, that's not such a good thing because basically if you're using the identity all over again, uh, then you have uh, some kind of privacy concern, of course. Um, and we also think that you might have plenty of them and they might be either verified or not verified. So basically, whenever you push the button up there and uh, say, yes, I want to add another another identity, you can just create another identity and that's a standard uh, conform W3C standard conform identity uh, created. And, uh, and later on, you might get it verified. And of course, uh, they can be uh, extended with all kinds of attributes uh, so that you're able to uh, fill up the identity with more information uh, whatever you need. So the other thing, which is part of the identity, otherwise it would be just an address book kind of thing, uh, is, uh, those additions, which are connected to the identity space. So credentials or, 
uh, certificates, you could call them as well certificates. Um, it could be uh, various kinds of things, let's say a certificate that you made some kind of education uh, somewhere and uh, now you get a certificate from the university uh, that you are uh, the, the holder of that particular certificate and you can always prove to somebody uh, that uh, you can, uh, that you actually made that kind of uh, education. The other thing are connected services. That's very uh, unique. Uh, we, we see there are a couple of different things. So it could be something on web pages, so web services, and you could kind of log in somewhere. But you also could have another application on the mobile phone and you're just deep linking, uh, deep linking to, uh, to, the, to the other application. And there is another thing which is called consent receipts. Um, which is um, kind of in the early stage of standardization, uh, something like a receipt in a grocery store, uh, you're buying something, you get a receipt at the end. So uh, the, this uh, concept works in this way that you're basically getting a receipt when you are uh, consenting to something and uh, kind of thinking a little ahead. Uh, it could be that basically working towards something where you can can, can uh, retract that kind of uh, consent you given. And uh, it's very clear that, okay, there is no consent anymore from your side. So now after identity, uh, we are getting to the crypto wallets. And um, what we build into the wallet uh, is um, two kinds of accounts. Um, and as you know, we have in the Ethereum space, we have uh, externally owned accounts, which is basically a key pair. Um, and, uh, and we also have uh, safe accounts. So we call them safe accounts uh, in line with the Gnosis safe. Um, and uh, the, uh, these are smart contract uh, accounts. So basically the interesting part is that the funds are not directly connected to the key, but they are in the smart contract on that particular blockchain. And uh, one and those those uh, funds within that account can be managed by somebody uh, who has owner rights. And uh, and. So when we started integrating uh, the Gnosis safe uh, contract suite, let's say, because a lot of contracts are generated when you are actually um, saying, yes, I want to create a safe account. Um, uh, the, um, we we uh, basically, um, we basically uh, did, did that, um, connect well let's put it this way so we are we connected it this uh this this save accounts to the regular accounts and they are the uh, first owners of that save account and uh it gives us the option that we are um creating other um other wallets and then they integrate as an owner and then they can just kind of spend the funds within that safe account what we also did, um, we, we increased or extended the code with a beacon. And there, Austin uh, from Bruno Wallet, he, he uh, had a, a good suggestions and, and, and thank you for, uh, for, for making that. So he did some integration in the Bruno Wallet for a beacon. And uh, we, we extended the Gnosis uh, safe accounts, uh, safe contracts uh, with, uh, with a beacon functionality so that we actually can see that the owner is, is added, uh, which gives us the option that basically other wallets can uh, listen to that beacon and can actually show that you are made an owner in that particular safe account, um, which basically means that you can create such a safe account in your wallet and add somebody else's wallet, uh, somebody else's address uh, as an owner, and he now can spend um, he now can spend uh, the the funds within that within that safe account. It's pretty neat. 
Um, the other thing is multi-network. So um, I don't know if 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 you had that problem, but uh, in the very beginning, when we uh, when we launched the artist network, of course you 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 want to be in some wallets there, and uh, and it's uh, it's not that easy to be be integrated into a wallet, and uh, we want to to go there a, a very different kind of direction. So basically, every Ethereum network, test network, or main network uh, should be integratable, um, and uh, and it is uh, because the logic is very different here. We are adding accounts whenever you whenever you um, yeah want to add another account, you push the plus on the on the button, and then you are getting to this uh, new account kind of screen, and there you choose the network you want to add another account and right now we have uh artist tau one rinky b and and sokol and poa uh they're they're uh, right now integrated and there are several others uh which which we kind of intend to 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 integrate as well um another thing is that we're uh we're listening to uh ens so basically if you're transferring some value uh from from a safe account or regular account uh you can use uh ens names uh which are defined either on robson if it's testnet or on ethereum if it's mainnet um and uh send it uh, basically there so you just have to type in uh, whatever kind of um ens name you have and you're sending the funds so now the third one is services and uh there we have uh, another screen which is called services of course so basically there uh you you see uh the applications or web pages or some integrated automation uh what you did uh so far so it's typically done that you're initiating uh, a QR code scan and then you're scanning a QR code but of course if you're uh, deep linking to another application like the one shown up here the M27 which is a, a demo banking application uh, when you dare basically ask for for uh, authorization then it, it's sending a request to uh, or it's checking if there is Minerva installed it's sending a request to the application uh, then uh, you're getting a question if you really want to connect with that application and from then on it is kind of listed in the services there uh, and whenever you want to have a second factor authentication for a bank transaction uh, you could use uh, the signature from Minerva as a second factor so coming back to what I said from 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 the beginning so all these kind of many different kind of solutions from our banks uh, where you have different kind of uh, solutions in, in connection with PSD2 where, where they have to introduce the uh, second factor authentication. Uh, they are they are like uh, could be solved with this one. So because uh, basically they're uh, compliant with regulation and they could have a second factor just easily in this way and don't there is no need for uh, additional signing applications or something like that. So what you currently see. Um, so whenever you are, um, whenever you're connecting to a service, uh, the the application is asking you uh, what kind of identity you want to connect it with, uh, and uh, basically you're choosing from the existing identities or uh, we also uh, made their own incognito identity, which is basically a uh, a made up identity. Uh, let's just assume you want to log in into some kind of forum where you only log in once and you're not, you're kind of tired of, of choosing again uh, another login. Uh, so you could just make up one. Uh, but it, it, the other thing is like, uh, it's important that you're free to choose with what kind of information you're going into uh, various kind of applications and services. So it is demo time. So uh, I will now stop uh, screen sharing. 
um, from the presentation. Just a second. I guess I will share something else. So now you should actually see um, the screen for uh, from Minerva. So basically, um, you see here the identities. So I fill out a couple of identities um, and um, and here are the values. And uh, the values, basically, you see now here, uh, I have here one regular account at the top. I have uh, two safe accounts um, attached to that regular account. Uh, one with 9.5 ATS and the other one with zero. And then there is another Rinkeby account and a POA uh, account uh, attached in that in that wallet. And um, and I just to save a little bit of time, I um, in the in the second uh, safe account, um, if I open the settings menu, there. Uh, we see already two owners um, in the in the settings, and I just show you how it looks in the in the other one. Uh, there, you only have the one, which is basically the, the the account at the top, so the regular account. So, if I look at the at the uh, at the owner, what we have added here, that's actually um, the the first key. Um, the first key of the card. That's interesting what we're going to do right now. So I'm sharing my, you should see my, basically my screen now. So basically I've, I've extracted the, the first key from the card, printed it on the back of the card and uh, have basically scanned it uh, into the into the first uh, safe account. So now that particular card can actually uh, kind of uh, spend money from the safe account. So you remember it's 9.5. Um, and now we are going to our jukebox setting here. So uh, we have here a record player uh, with some record on it. Uh, something like a 30-year-old record player. And uh, we have a NFC or RFID reader over there. And uh, the and there is a Raspberry Pi uh, running there. And he uh, is actually is creating a um, is creating a transaction um, for for the record player. And that's basically this one is the account for the record player and uh, and just checking uh, currently it has like four ATS uh, on it. So we said, well, we want to have the record player play for one minute uh, if I pay one ATS uh, to the record player. So if I put the card uh, here on, on the reader, here, you, here we are. Can you hear the music? Or do I need to tune up? So it plays now for about a minute. And it plays now for a minute and then it stops. And in the meantime, we can start screen sharing again. And as you can see, the value changed from 9.5 to 8.5. So basically, we spent now uh, one ATS for the jukebox and Maybe maybe we can uh, do that for the jukebox you just showed me for before uh, as well. Yeah, Stefan has been been bugging me since we started Parallel Nepolis. <laughs> uh, 
said to hook it up. So, um, yeah, man, come and do it. For sure. <laughs> we're, 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 we're into that. Um, I, you know, what would be really cool would be to integrate Sibilier, uh micro uh, uh, streaming transactions. So, you know, just like you, you can do with payroll, you could say, okay, for however long it is that you play the content, that's the only amount of time that you play, that you pay. Yeah. So not necessarily a price for the whole, you know, the whole object itself. Yeah, you're the length consume it. You probably liked the, the work we did uh, on streaming, but that's something else. So basically we, we had the same setup and we did some streaming money, meaning money is flowing from one account to the other. And yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. yeah. And, and we have, we have a demo there as well, but that's not, Right now, right now we, we have to focus to the other one. So good. So yeah, yeah, we had a similar incident, but finally it worked. So, um, you know, it's like when we look at something like uh, the jukebox here, um, we definitely uh, need to talk about real life use cases and one real life use cases with such a wallet like like Minerva, uh, we worked on last weekend's hackathon um, regarding an immunity certificate. And I remember that Smuggler was, was talking about uh, that the other day that uh, something like uh, immune certificates uh, could come uh, in the future and uh, putting that into something where you really say, well, I can handle my own certificate. Uh, is 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 kind of a, a easy to do thing for a completely decentralized wallet. But if you are uh, kind of collecting all the all those certificates on a central place, uh, we're we're uh, going a very very different direction. Uh, and so we we proposed an idea uh, on this one to handle those certificates directly in a user controlled wallet uh, like Minerva. But basically, you can do it in all the identity wallets out there uh, because it's anywhere open standard and use that kind of information to um, to protect the, the vulnerable uh, people and basically to avoid that we uh, we we are spreading uh, the virus in an in an uncontrolled fashion uh, that's just a real life use case for for the wallet uh, and kind of uh, fits basically in the in the current mood and and things what governments are uh, partially doing with more or less surveillance kind of intention. Um, <clears throat> so I'm basically at the end of my presentation. I uh, would like to uh, to ask that uh, you help creating that commons. Uh, we consider uh, such a wallet uh, still part of the commons. It's not just the blockchains. Uh, it is uh, basically the access to those blockchains um, should be uh, commons as well and uh, therefore uh, we ask for donations unfortunately we did not uh, did not kind of apply for a gitcoin grant uh, it was kind of busy uh, the last weeks um, and um, and but we can offer uh, various kinds of networks so ethereum ethereum plastic artists xdai poa uh, we don't care that much what network is used uh, but there are other ways uh, where you can help us, support us. You can go to our web page. Uh, there is a form uh, to uh, to apply for becoming a Minerva tester um, and, and get early access, uh, looking into uh, basically what we're doing, how the user flow is, uh, feedbacking on that one. Of course, we look very much forward if you look at the code, comment it, there is, um, we, we do have a GitLab development, but uh, have just recently uploaded it to GitHub. We are, there are some known issues, uh, what we're working on. And of course, you find us on Gitter uh, and, and get to chat with us. Um, now it needs just kind of say thank you. Uh, so I, I really appreciated the work uh, with binary apps, so the, the with them we worked on the wallet very much, and um, and the funding came from Citra in Finland. Uh, they they funded uh, basically that development, 
And if you want to follow us on Twitter, uh, just go for Minerva, uh, Minerva Wallet. And uh, the Latin Collective has all kinds of communication channels. And you can, of course, also uh, ping me directly. So thank you very much for your attention. So cool. I love common space projects. That's for sure. <laughs> So, so I'm curious about which NFC protocol you used. Are, are you using the status key card open API for NFCs or are you using a legacy uh, institution NFC communication protocol? How did you bridge that uh, in your application to the crypto? Uh, it's provided by uh, by Infineon, but it's not proprietary. It's, it's like it's an open protocol and it's... Uh, it's made open source available even on GitHub. So it's kind of untypical what they kind of did. Uh, usually a company like Infineon doesn't do something like that. But uh, yeah, but part of what Status was doing with their key card actually sort of made that happen, if I recall correctly. It's cool that yeah. Infineon did that. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, it's, uh, yeah. I can't can't remember. It's it, it's those kind of low level commands you actually send to the card and get it back. Uh, I I'm not I'm, I was not part of the development, so I can't. I I need to answer it separately. I can't answer it directly. It's not, it's not such an important detail. I was I was just curious about it. Um, yeah, I love it, seeing these NFC solutions. Yeah, but it, it, there is even uh, 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 um, the implementation we are using for uh, transferring uh, coins on from the cards to the card from the card, uh, it's open source on GitHub. So it was uh, it was made available. So basically that you have a you have a um, Android application. Uh, it was written for Ethereum, but we just kind of changed it to uh, to Artis in our case. But basically that's a, a simple change. So uh, you can do it for every kind of uh, blockchain you want. Uh, as long as you're kind of adding just a kind of a mainnet and a testnet, then you don't have to do really much changes on the on the application. Yeah. So, Didi, why don't you? Uh, is there something that you'd like to add to this? Uh, hi, I'm just providing links to what uh, what you're talking about. You're involved with the project, I think. Yes, cool. I'm working with Thomas in Lab Ten. And what are you doing? Uh, uh, well, <laughs> I'm mostly technical stuff. Yeah, so I, 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 I work type. in the background. You work in the background, okay? I like the party hat. <laughs> the what? I like the party hat that you're wearing. The party hat. Hi. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not even seeing my picture. Right now. <laughs> yeah. I'm curious. So, so. Uh, were there any major bottlenecks or or solutions that you had to solve, or did you, or was it really easy for you guys to plug and play and adapt with with code bases that were out there? Well, uh, there's there's a lot of learning. Um, to give an example, I, I would say the Gnosis safe was not uh, so easy to approach. Um, so some things just require enough time to dig into it, but yeah, you know, once you're there, feels good. <laughs> it yeah, we, we use the we use the Gnosis Safe uh, to for for our funds, and it's excellent product. Yeah, no, it's cool. It's not it's just when you uh, when you interact with uh, smart contract systems. Um, there's a limit to how much feedback you get when something is wrong. So if you do something wrong with the signatures, there's, you know, something with the encoding or so, it, it just won't work. It's difficult to, to figure out what exactly went wrong. You really need to be precise and go step by step. But yeah, it's, we, we got there. Yeah, I, I remember when Didi uh, added the beacon functionality uh, suggested by Austin. Uh, it took him quite some time that he finally could it get it working, and it's like because the Gnosis safe is so such on so much on the limit what you can deploy to the chain. Uh, so yeah. yeah, for example, what happened there is uh, 
basically it was a trivial change. However, it turned out that the way the um, Gnosis safe contracts were set up, uh, it was already at the limit of the gas limit. So the repo was, uh, traffic, the traffic config um, had set optimization off. And if you added just one uh, method to the uh, safe master contract, it blew the gas limit. But the error uh, message didn't really make that clear, only after quite some time spending on, on trying stuff and trying to figure out, I, I eventually figured out that, um, I don't remember, there's an EP which uh, limits the gas which can be consumed by one transaction, which is lower than the block gas limit. And that basically was it. So the solution was easy to, it was to enable optimization and, comp and compiling, but it was difficult to figure it out. Yeah, cool. Have you, have you heard of Embark? Yes. Are you using Embark to, to develop in? Because they have awesome debugging tools in the cockpit uh, when, you're, when you're writing your, your contracts. Yeah, it's, the problem is just when you start from an existing project, like uh, in this case, save contracts, it's not so trivial to move it to, to another system, I guess. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these little bits and pieces I always find to be really interesting, you know, uh, digging down until until you find out where you've gone wrong. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> cool. Does anybody else have any other questions? Yeah. Um, Thomas, yes. it's nice to meet you. I was really excited when your application came in and uh, to see that there's activity down there in Graz and uh, really wanted to have you in Vienna like I mentioned at the beginning. Looking forward to meet you guys in person. Yes, uh, we, we too. So uh, I hope we can travel soon yeah. uh, again. And uh, yeah, yeah, come to one of your Tuesdays, uh, yeah. Tuesday meetups, right? Yeah, a lot, a lot of great stuff happening down there in Graz around your collective, man. Thanks so much for joining. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me.